in Kedleston Hall, and before your old man snuffed it, he taught you how to snare rabbits. So off you go and you snare a couple of rabbits, right? And sorry, that's the wrong story. Why <laughs> back? Sorry. Right, I'm a farmer, you're illiterate, you're out of work, your old man's dead, <laughs> your kids are starving, and for the last three days, I've seen you wandering down the road. It doesn't work quite the same with a lady, to be honest with you. Walking down the road, and each day you've stopped outside one of my fields, leaning over the gate, ogling at my sheep. <laughs> and on the fourth day, one of my sheep's gone missing. It were you. Yeah. I know it were you, because you, I've seen you there three days on the drop, watching my sheep, and on the fourth day, you see, that's true what they say about Derby County supporters. <laughs> anyway, that's, so, sorry enough, sheep hangers. Um, anyway, so, you're arrested, you're brought to Derby Jail, you're put on trial for sheep stealing. Who are they going to believe, you or me? I'm a farmer, landed gentry, I uh, drink in the same uh, tavern as the prosecution, guys. Uh, I'm in the same club as the judge. And needless to say, they find you guilty, they believe me. You didn't do it, by the way. You just like sheep, like most Derby County supporters do. <laughs> so, um, they hang you. Sorry, they sentence you to death. You're hanged within three days of being sentenced to death. You have to conduct your own defence. There is no appeal. It's very very unfair right now we've got another case here of a young lad of 23 he's got four kids already his wife's pregnant with the fifth his kids are starving to death so off he goes to Kedleston Hall and snares two rabbits this is the story of <laughs> as he's coming out of the woods he's caught by the gamekeeper brought to Derby jail put on trial for snaring rabbits, which is one of the 222 hanging offences. He's sentenced to death to hang. He's hanged within three days. Not only condemning him to death, but probably his kids, probably his wife. Well, they're starving anyway. That's why he went to snare them. That's why he risked his life. He knew it was a hanging offence, but he still needed to get food for those children. And so not only is he going to die, but he's pro probably his kids are going to die as well. He knows that and could himself before being hanged. And he is hanged. Right, another lad, um, Joseph Wielden from Holland Ward, Derbyshire, hacked his niece and nephew to death with a gorse hook. It's, it's a bit like a scythe for hedging, but it's a bit straighter than a scythe. It's got a longer pole on it. The little girl, wrong, the little boy, of eight to put up a fight, and he, he hacked him to pieces. And his little sister of four was beheaded by their uncle, by Uncle Joseph. It's incredible, but he, uh, anyway, he, and he was hanged. They were both hanged. Well, hang on a minute. So we're talking executions, whether you believe in execution or you don't believe in execution, which of those two people deserve to hang? <laughs> yeah, Joseph Wheeler. But the lad that stole the rabbits was hanged as well. And this went on from 1723 until 1752, when someone came up with a brilliant idea that we really, really needed to make the punishment fit the crime. And so the church, God bless them, back to the same old thing, you know, the church makes all the rules for, for judicial punishments and everything else realised that they needed to make the punishment for the murderer worse than the punishment for the pickpocket, the rapist, the, the sheep stealer, the horse stealer, the whatever. Um, the man that blacked his face and went in the woods at night was seen on the street with a sooty face was a hanging offence. Appearing on the street with a sooty face was a hanging offence. Uh, breaking down riverbanks, cutting down ornamental trees, Cavorting with gypsies for more than three weeks. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Bestiality. Bestiality. There's what, yeah. 
last hanging of bestiality in Derby, Shire, 1833. A young lad from Yeldersley near Ashbourne. And of course, you can guess where it was, can't you? It was a sheep. There you go. Um, so, they realised they needed, so they came up with the church, really, and the government, they came up with a terror beyond death. Terror beyond death, guys. Marriage? Um, terror beyond death. Right, um, one or two people have come up with all sorts of things like uh, perhaps they should go out. What about what about killing all the family of the murderer? It's a bit drastic. So anyway, this was for a murderer. A terror beyond death for a murderer. Right, the first thing was that no murderer after 1752 was allowed to be buried. No six foot of English earth, no gravestone with your name on it, no family around the grave. No Christian burial service to lay to rest. No, if you're not at rest, you're, this is where the ghost of it comes in, you're abroad, you're wandering the earth as a tormented soul. Yeah? And they knew this before, and they were terrified of this. The families were terrified because they got no closure. You may, you may be a murderer if you did it, but even so, you still needed closure. So, no burial. Okay, what would they do with the body? The murder act of 1752 stated quite clearly this was this was the sentence of death for a murderer that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead and then publicly dissected in the shire hall in St Mary's Day. bottom of St Mary's Day, where the courts are now after you were dead hopefully dead because you could still be alive after half an hour um, especially in the winter if you were you see they believe that that the criminals had an incredible sense of self de- self preservation. Most criminals were thick set with big bull necks, and they, they and if it was winter and hypothermia set in, you could still be alive after half an hour. The body was stripped, laid back on the cart, taken to the shire hall, laid on a dissecting table, and the first thing they did to you was galvanise you. That's electricity. They wired you up, this is in 1752, they wired you up to a battery in a huge uh, vat of water, a uh, bath of water with, with zinc uh, towers and copper. I don't know how they did it in those days, but they did. And one of your legs would go up in the air, the eyes would blink, your chest would heave, your face would grimace. People fled because it was public. There'd be up to 5,000 people queuing uh, down St. Peter's Street, uh, wrong, uh, uh, Iron Gate, King Street, down St. Mary's Gate to view the body before dissection. A big crowd of people to watch the dissection, and as this body appeared to be coming back up to life, people fled. It's coming back to life. Which, of course, isn't far from the truth, is it? How do we bring people back to life these days? Yeah, electricity. Erasmus Darwin, from Darwin, grandfather of Charles Darwin, was a doctor dissected bodies in Derby and was fascinated by electricity. And he used to galvanise his bodies. When Mary Shelley wrote the novel Frankenstein, the preface to the book, then we've got one, have a look. The inspiration for this novel is Dr. Darwin of Derby. Wow, how's about that? So, basically, what the first thing they did was skin the body. Dead, hopefully, would be by then. Galvanised, so galvanised first, then they skinned you. <coughs> Excuse me, flayed your skin, sent it to the tan yard in Full Street, and tanned, tanned your skin. Used it to find books, telling you life and time. If it was a big enough piece of skin, a pair of slippers for the local man, out of your skin. Um, your bones were boiled in a big cauldron in, in the Shire Hall to get the meat off them. And then, the bones would be sent to a skeleton maker and wired up to make a skeleton presented to the local hospital or university. Um, your bits were removed and examined and cut up for the furtherance of medical science. Uh, punchline of this story is the body wasn't whole. And that meant, back to the church again, and all the, if the body wasn't whole, then on the day of judgment, there'd be no material resurrection for you. Where are you going to go? Do not ask go. Go straight to hell and burn in hell fire for eternity. They knew this 
in the condemned cell. They were terrified, not of death, but of the alcohol. They believed they were going to burn in hell. And it's creative. We were not doing ghosts tonight, but that's one of the reasons there's so many ghosts around, because of the church and what it's, what it's preached over the last 2000. Let's get off the subject, Richard. Don't mention that anymore. So, um, that's hanging by the net until you are dead. Hopefully dead. But if not, right, fascinating.